the African Heavy Metal Show brought to you exclusively by Dilly Gaff Radio and the Dean Machine. a band called Helter Skelter, also from the late 80s. Um, what I've tried to do is actually line bands up that uh, started, like like I said, with VOD and Ragnarok back in 86. And as the bands followed in the wake of Black Rose through the 80s into the 90s, I've tried to line up a bunch of songs like that. So if any of your bands, uh, if I get you wrong on the timeline, don't be offended. 
been a long time. Anyway, there was a band called Helter Skelter, um, my buddy Steve K. Clough on vocals there, eh? I mean on guitar. What a great guitarist. They also released that song, um, Re- Revolution Rock, which actually went to number one, I believe, on Radio 5 back in the late 80s, or could have been early 90s. So next up, we're going to check out a band that came out in 1991. Second band to release a full-length final. Contrary to popular belief that this band was the first band to release a full-length metal vinyl in South Africa, they weren't. Black Rose were the band that I played earlier, but this band released the second one and probably an album that really took off and made uh, the metal scene in South Africa get a bit of notice on, on radio and in the media. A band that needs no mention, a band called Odyssey. whom I was uh, privileged enough to play rhythm guitar for. Mr. Bryn Addison, also now in, uh, living in Belgium, playing for a band called Guilt Monkey. Lead guitar and vocals, Neil Ford on bass, Lawrence Bailey on drums, who was also previously with Ragnarok. And myself on rhythm guitar. Now this Odyssey vinyl has been selling on eBay. Uh, with metal vinyl collectors around the world for like $500. It's ridiculous. I've got to say, man, back in the scene was um, members that left Ragnarok. Steven, who I mentioned, he went and formed Helter Skelter. The band that I just played there before this with a song called Ready to Rock. So Odyssey, the band that released the full second full length final in South Africa. We're gonna check out my favorite track from that album called Ozone. This is a Delegaf radio with the African metal and hard rock show streaming out of London, UK.
band called Urban Assault out of Johannesburg. Michael Gill on guitar. Adrian Lay on bass. Steve Island on vocals. And I uh, can't remember who the other guitarist was, even if there is one. I don't think there was. As for that Odyssey band, we are going to feature another song a bit later. You can um, check them out on facebook.com slash odyssey1991 if you want to know more information about what's going on with that that album and uh, there's a lot of talk on there about um, Bryn getting the, the masters from in-house records in um, Johannesburg and uh, re-releasing that album because there's a lot of people that are collectors all over the world that want the album and uh, are asking for digital copies this recording you can hear in the background was a uh, Ragnarok as well uh, in, uh, back in 88 we placed a tape recorder in the middle of the of my dad's basement. Didn't come out too badly for a single microphone tape recorder, did it? A tone deaf singing going on there. Next up, a band uh, that I played on the very first episode of this African metal show called Jaded Jane. Members of Ragnarok, Sash Vakaman, he also wants uh, Ragnarok. Once he left Ragnarok, he went and formed this band. Chuck Bowden on vocals, Justin Robb on drums. There's a song from Jaded Jane called Industry. You are tuned to Billy Gaff Radio.
can hear by now the bands were starting to get really flippin' heavy. There was a band called Debauchery with a song called Medium to Rare. It's funny, you know, as the world, as the, as the metal scene in the world exploded, like um, Metallica came out in 83 and then uh, there was the whole thrash explosion and death metal and all that stuff. It, it, it was happening in South Africa too, but because of... Um, apartheid and um, sanctions and all that against the country and 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 not even just that just the the whole conservative outlook of the country there like metal was was never big there and it still isn't and I don't think it will ever be a big thing there I mean when bands like Metallica and um, Lamb of God come and play in South Africa they sell out um, they sell out gigs like none other but when uh, the local bands play it's from what I hear it's still like it was back in those days few hundred people at a gig, if that, if you're lucky. Anyway, um, so as you could hear by now, that band debauchery, the bands were getting really heavy, fast, and uh, 
obviously influenced by what was going on in the rest of the world. So next up we're going to check out a band called Insurrection. A friend of mine, Brian Villain, who also plays for the band Ing. Um, I'm just reading on Ing's page, um, Brian will be playing bass for Sacrifix for the forthcoming Cataclysm shows in Cape Town. Cataclysm are touring South Africa. Um, obviously something wrong with uh, Sacrifix's bassist, so Brian is standing in for that. This was probably one of the fastest bands that to come out back in uh, the 90s in South Africa. Insurrection, my mate Jimmy on drums was um, word, I, I remember word spreading around the gig circuit about this drummer who had the fastest feet in the West. They were comparing him to, um, uh, to uh, Gene Hoglan from D Dark Angel. Before we hear some more from Mr. Edward Banks, let's check out Insurrection and a song called Anointed in Blood. Blood, 
Pretty Heavy Metal Show, brought to you exclusively by Billy Gap Radio and the Dean Machine. It wasn't until 2012 that I made a trip to South Africa again. It would have, that was my third trip to the country. Uh, but this time, since I had started writing the book, uh, while I was in the UK in 2011, um, I had a lot of information, I had a lot of research with me, and a year's worth of hard, hard research on it underneath my belt. Now, from the time I started to write it, there was now hard, hard research where I was literally waking up every day, and this is the only thing I was thinking about. Uh, so that's what I mean by that, because other times it was just it was just other sorts of research per se. I guess you could say I was researching it for, for since maybe 2007, but um, on top of writing a dissertation, I still managed to to conduct a lot of research, get a lot of interviews in with people, and just really start laying the foundation and start saving uh, money uh, right away. Because I wanted to see what would happen, but. A lot of great things started to happen, and the trip that I took to South Africa in 2012 was um, was amazing. Um, now I really got a good insight as to what was going on in South Africa's rock and metal community. It was more expansive, and there was much more depth than what I had originally thought. Uh, the history of it, uh, the struggle of... Um, the political struggles of the country and how heavy metal and hard rock and, and punk rock and hardcore uh, managed to survive all that. Um, I, it's not, it was it was one thing. It was fantastic. What was going on there? I remember in 2007 the the difficulty that fans had with finding the music that they they enjoyed, going to record stores there, and not even seeing it myself, but seeing. Uh, People on the streets are wearing Metallica T-shirts or Megadeth T-shirts or um, a Slipknot T-shirts, Machine Head. But uh, seeing that the music was extremely difficult for them to find in stores, or you, you were able to find it, it was just unbelievably expensive. But one thing that was out of the question for South Africans uh, in 2007 was the fact that they were just convinced that they would never, ever, ever see their favorite bands uh, and that's beginning to change uh, now and that's what I walked into I walked into a country that was a welcoming Metallica uh, to their for their second visit I walked into um, to a country that still still didn't have a, a sort of hard rock or heavy metal infrastructure but um, they had they had the will to do it and these were this is the scene that took off from the ground up uh, essentially on its own though though there was uh, Western reach um, they were still able to get uh, radio uh, I'm sorry songs on the radio from Western acts American acts European acts and they, they had a they had an everything was keeping up uh, sorry it was, everything was fairly current at the time but still accessing the music and there was political boycotts and whatnot uh, and as, as many of the metalheads had told me that for years they were just finding out what was going on in the, the metal world through six month old uh, metal hammer magazines or um, friends or relatives that would go overseas uh, would bring back some music with them just and tape trading uh, also crept its way in the country and that's how they were they were keen to find out so that's how they did it I thought that was pretty cool I thought South Africa was just awesome, and there's so many talented acts there. Uh, the words of Edward Banks there, author of Heavy Metal Africa. You can check that out on facebook.com slash pages slash heavy metal Africa. Just, um, just search for Heavy Metal Africa. Um, it's a book about life, passion, and heavy metal in the forgotten continent. And there's, uh, there's a lot of true stuff that he said. I mean... Back in the 80s and that, there's no way um, bands were coming to um, South Africa from, from anywhere in the world, especially metal bands. I mean, the only band we got to see in the 80s that I can remember, the international band, was Black Sabbath came to Sun City, which is in Bapulitswana. Um, obviously, it wasn't the, the Sabbath lineup with Ozzy, it was uh, the Sabbath lineup with um, Tony Martin 
and Dave the Beast Spitz, uh, Dan Spitz from Anthrax's, Anthrax's brother on bass. So, um, but still, I mean, it was a, a major event for us to see Black Sabbath live in South Africa, and uh, a couple other bands came as well: Wishbone Ash, Nazareth. But that was it, and like Edward says, it was extremely difficult for us to get our hands on um, on music. There were a few places, um, Hillbrow Records and Look and Listen that used to sell vinyls, and a couple of other places at Cresta Centre that used to bring in imported records. Um, I still have a, quite a big vinyl collection. Um, we had this list, the headbangers, the so-called headbangers, we had this list with um, that used to get passed around at the Golden Banana Club where people would write their names and their phone number on the list. Once you'd written your name and your number on it, you'd pass it on to the next person and forget about it. And at the end of the night, the person who ended up with the list would take it home and keep it. And then uh, the next gig that was going to be happening, it was his responsibility to phone everybody on the list and inform them about the gig or the get-together, whatever was happening for um, the headbangers in, in Johannesburg. And it worked pretty well. Let's check out a hardcore band from back in the 80s, a band called Groin Churn and a song called Already Dead. Coming, Alpha Bravo, Octopus. my memory serves me that was South Africa's first proper hardcore band Groin Churn founded in 1994 was a side project of Mark Chapman Sergio Cristina and uh, Christo Vesta, as far as I can remember. 
on bass and vocals. Alright, so next up we're going to feature a band that made a huge impact on the metal scene in South Africa. It came out mid-90s, a band called Metal Morphosis. Good friends of mine, Mark Vass on vocals, Dean Van Niekerk on guitar, David Owen on drums, Neil, can't remember his surname, on guitar, and Adam Thomas on bass guitar. You can check them out on facebook.com slash metalmorphosis. I'm just reading on there about section and once we all lived what we believed to be a life of rock stars. We lived it fast, we lived it wild, and we lived it totally out of control. It's a miracle we're all still alive. Quite a few guys have passed through that band. Etienne Kruger played drums at some stage. Neil Ward was his name. Rhythm guitar, later replaced by Gary Rankin. Neil Ford played bass as well. Pierre Salema and Derek Newman also played bass. Let's check it out. A song from there. Um, they released an EP called Blistered, and the first track off of that EP was called Boneyard. This is Metal Morphosis on the African Metal and Hard Rock Show.
Mark Pass on vocals there, the Mighty Metamorphosis. I'm just reading a, an, an interview off of, their, off of their page from some magazine back in South Africa in the 90s. Um, and one of the questions that was was, is metal's always been popular? Only in this country, fans are fucked. I've never traveled, I've traveled abroad and I've seen bands play live. There you'll see, over, overseas you'll see Bon Jovi fan at a Slayer gig or a Sepultura fan at a Poison gig. Over here in South Africa, you're a faggot if you like Bon Jovi. All fans are divided because not many rockers attend a metal gig and vice versa. We will always have a lot more. We would have a lot more exposure if people open their minds. So what if you dig the death and rock and grunge? It's true. I remember back in the day in South Africa, the heavy bands were just completely ignored. They didn't get any um, airplay. They didn't get noticed at gigs. And uh, if somebody came there wearing a bunch of his t-shirt, he was beaten up and slapped around and a bunch of wankers. Anyway, another band that came out that actually toured, uh, did a lot of gigs with Metamorphosis was a band called Two Dogs Funking. Three of the members in that band I played earlier, Odyssey, formed this band called Two Dogs Funking, which was a more kind of a funk metal, funk rock kind of band. Caused a lot of trouble wherever they played these two bands. Let's check them out of a song called Juggernaut. This is Dean Machine streaming from London, UK.
Bulldogs Funking with a song called Juggernaut. That was the band that had to do 10 gigs for the Hells Angels. Or was it more? Because one of their guys got shot at one of our gigs and uh, they thought it was us. There was also the band that the singer got hammered in the head with a ballpen hammer by the Hells Angels. The singer being me. Without further ado, we're going to play a band called Batarei Niecha. For those of you that don't understand Afrikaans, it sounds pretty much... So I'm sure you can decipher what it means. Batarei Niecha means Battery 9. For the song called I'm Home. Hi, this is Gabriel from Metal Horizon and you are listening to Daily Gav Radio Station with the Dean Machine. <laughs> 
Don't touch the dial and keep rocking. Right, that last band but I saw them playing at the Gasworks one night and they had like a railway track and smashing it with hammers and jack hammers on stage and all. Mm. I'm sure it was them. There was also a band, Love Jimmy Presley, who used to do the same thing mm. with angle grinders. They used angle grinders instead of guitars. Mm. Used to get fried in the front row. Mm. Okay, so I believe uh, Iron Aiden is listening in from Wales and the Tooth Fairy gave him five pounds because he ran with his mouth into a machine gun and knocked his tooth out. So this next one's for you, Aiden. Your uncles, Robbie and Dean, this is their band, Brothering. Band out of the late 90s in South Africa called Brothering. Um, a song called Miracle Man. Check it out. The African Heavy Metal Show brought to you exclusively by Dilly Garth Radio and the Dean Machine.